Part 1. A little bit on standard operating procedure and recommendations on file management. Okay, so when you're working with things like the practice round or the qualifier rounds, we will, after about two weeks' time, have to go through and delete all of our files related to that. So that's a thing that's very important for the competition. To make that easier, and also to make it easier while working with your actual materials, I recommend having two different extra folders. So when you're coming in and you're going to actually work a practice round or a qualifier round, like for instance, we'll be looking at or we're trying to set up for qualifier round one, I might go to my desktop, right click, make a new folder, go down to new and folder, and I'm going to put QR1. Okay, what I recommend is put all of your files related to this particular scenario in that folder so that after you do your debrief and when we get to the deadline that we have to delete all the materials, we can log back in, you can just delete that folder and you know that you've gotten rid of everything. Well, how do we get the stuff in there? Okay, well, you would have gone through the website, you would have downloaded the things, and most likely your VDF and mission brief would end up in your downloads folder. So uh, for most versions of Windows, you can do the following. I've created this new folder, so I'm going to go ahead and double click on it to open it up. And then over here on the quick access, there's a good chance that you've actually got downloads. Otherwise, you can go through and find your downloads folder, but I'm just going to click on it. Now I got a couple of things in here, but the main one that I want is this weathering heights. This is the one that we're going to take a look at that I've made to go through for this sample setup. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to click on that. You can either right click and go down to cut or when you click on it you can hit control X. That'll make it go translucent here like it's kind of clear but not completely invisible. Okay great. Then what I can do is I want to go back over to my QR1. I can open up this folder and I'm going to paste this in there. Now, an important thing to keep track of, close the other window, is this is where you're going to keep track of all of your files. And then that way, later, we can go in and we can delete everything. Here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to open this up. It'll take a moment for STK to load it up, but we're going to go ahead and set that up. One thing that we've noticed is, and I'll give you a couple examples, sometimes when you're working with STK, it'll kind of, for want of a better term, wig out some and stop giving you, well, the values that you actually want or it may have switched settings and it might be giving you values and you may not realize that they're necessarily wrong. So the first thing that you need to do, just like we've done now, I have loaded my scenario. Before you do anything else, let's go up to File, Save As, and then instead of just saving over this, you definitely do not want to do that. I'm going to come down to the file name and I'm going to put dash, uh, maybe your initials, or a great thing to look at is, so it is 4.22 p.m. right now where I am at, and so that would be 16.22 in military time. So this is one where when you're working through with your team, as long as you're adding that time in there, as you make more files, if you opt to do that, then you've also got them where they'll automatically sort in chronological order. You can give it other names if you would like, but organization and knowing what things came later might be useful. So I'm going to do save as. Okay, so here's the thing. If I mess up some stuff, I can always go back to that original file. This is incredibly important for a couple of reasons. Now, one other thing that I'm going to talk about real quick is, so uh, you'll notice that we only see like half of the Earth in our 3D view. Partly that's because I created this scenario on another computer, my desktop, and my desktop has 4K monitors that are actually dual monitors, so I've got a lot of screen real estate. But the main thing that I want to emphasize is the size of the screens is actually saved into the file and based off of the original computer on which it was set up. So when you open it up, depending on what your settings are or depending on what the original uh, creator's settings were, you might end up with something like this where your window's a little too big. Okay, well we can come up here and I can shrink this down some just so I can get it where it's a little bit better. You might have to do that a couple times to get the vertical part fixed up, but you want to kind of see the bottom so that you can kind of see it for you. And then you can grab here in the corner and we can drag this over so it's a more agreeable size. The other thing that you can do, because my 2D map is similarly ultra large, we can also go to window and we can do things like tile vertically and that will automatically resize all the windows that are open. But I just want to mention that because you might open it up and you might have really large uh, windows where it's really hard to see what's going on. Um, I think that also happens when I make files off of this laptop, which many of my scenarios are as well. And this is a higher resolution than some other computers, say the laptops we use to train. Okay, 
But I went through and I said, okay, as we make all these changes, we can go through, let's say that it's been 20, 30 minutes and I've made some changes, okay? So I'm gonna go back in and I'm gonna call it, let's say 20 minutes later, 1642. It is not actually that, it'd be 1624, but, and you're welcome to use 424 if you'd like, but if you're going afternoon, like having military time might be an easy way to get, to deal with that. Okay, a couple things to note on this, one of them, I've seen this feedback a lot from StellarX, so if we go to right-click and properties, this satellite, the one called BoomerSat, which we're going to take a look at with some of our other prep things that'll show up later in this video, and most of Stellar Explorer's scenarios are actually set to a propagator of J2 perturbation, but there are other propagators. There's a two-body, J2, J4. We've even see, seen HPOP and a couple of others in there as well. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on what these are, but suffice it to say that this basically sets up exactly how close STK is paying attention to all the various factors that might affect space uh, mission design. A great example on this is, if you've been in a physics class, the two-body approach is very simplified, and it might be the equivalent of looking at a problem solving forces and saying, ignoring friction and ignoring air resistance. Well, you'll get a pretty good answer, but it won't be a perfect answer because in real life we would have friction and air resistance. Well, J2 perturbation might go in and say, okay, well, this one we're going to pay attention to friction, but we're still going to ignore air resistance. Okay, a little bit harder, but a little bit more precise. The J4 might say, okay, we're going to go in, we're going to do all the calculations for friction and air resistance. Well, you may be thinking, okay, why aren't we doing just the one that does all the stuff to represent real life. Well, part of it's balancing the requirements for your computer as well. Not everyone has a high-end computer, and so by making it do even more calculations, that can be rough on the computer and slow down analysis period. J2 perturbation seems to be the most popular one. We'll almost always have that, but you never know. They might have it switched to something else, say to include atmospheric drag effects if we're in low Earth orbit or below. All right. So one other thing that I want to mention on this is I've seen students accidentally change things. So I'm going to move my mouse around and watch perigee altitude. I'm not even going to click on it, but I'm going to move my mouse wheel. Oh, it just changed to perigee radius, eccentricity. And I didn't even click on it. So I come up here, if I'm moving past J2 perturbation and I accidentally hit my mouse scroll while I'm doing it, I've now set my system to two body. It'll still give me all these numbers, but the numbers are now going to be different from the numbers that Stellar is going to find when they actually grade this. Okay, let's say that I didn't catch it because mistakes happen. The same thing can actually happen with your classical coordinate type or your coordinate system, which were other things that they warned us might get changed. And what if I didn't even see that I had the two body on there and it got applied and I've been working this problem for five hours, come to find out none of my numbers are reliable. Okay, well, that's why you want to keep track of your actual values, which ones seem to be working and which ones don't. What I'd recommend is maybe every 30 minutes, maybe every hour, however often you and your team decide, you might go through, do a save as, I'll go through and put this as uh, 1643, maybe this was a minute later. Okay, great. Then I'm going to close this. Then... I'm right here in my QR folder, I can see all of them. I could load the latest one, but I'm afraid I may have accidentally changed something, so why don't I just go back to the original one? The original one, if you are very careful, will always have the correct settings. And if nothing else, even if you aren't going to do this every hour or every two hours or anything like that, though that might be a good idea, though it takes a little bit of time to close this down and you might need to resize your windows again. but. At the very least, right before you're going to go in and submit your solution, you might close it down, load back up from the original file, and put in your what your preferred solution is, and double check you've got it right. You might even do that maybe half an hour or so before the actual submission time. If you're doing it at the last minute and you find a problem, you may be stuck. But this is just some standard operating procedure. The other thing that I'll bring up on this is, on Boomersat, let's see, uh, satellite, we've got the orbit wizard. Now for my students in particular, which this video is actually kind of designed for, you've probably not even seen this before unless you saw additional materials. Mainly because I keep seeing posts from Stellar that says, hey, if you use this thing, sometimes it'll change things like the propagator or the coordinate system or all sorts of stuff. So I've kind of avoided it, though there are a lot of things that it can help you actually design very quickly, different types of orbits. 
if you want to play around with this, I'm not going to stop you, but I would recommend that after you've done some work with it, found something that you like, you might do exactly what I said. Maybe save things, close it down, and reload your original file, and double check that it's still giving you the right numbers. Because as soon as you get your propagator or one of the other settings switched to something else, you are no longer getting the numbers that you will be graded on. You're getting numbers, but they're not that useful for you. All right, that's a little bit on standard operating procedure. And once again, one other, oh, sorry, one final thing. Let's say that this is my final solution on this, and I'm going to upload it at the end of the round. So I'm gonna to go to save as, and then I'm going to put in the appropriate actual submission stuff. I don't know, 0501 or something like that. Whatever my team number is, make certain you know that, and that you are using exactly the file format that you are instructed to do. We do also want to make certain that it is a VDF and not scenariofiles.sc. By default, it may switch over to scenario files, but just drop it down to VDF. And then you can save it in the QR1 folder, that's perfectly fine, but one of the other things that I recommend, the other folder that you might have, and you can create it just like QR1, is on the desktop, I have an uploads folder. Okay, I've got a bunch of things that are actually in there for other things that I upload. But instead of like trying to find every single file that I want to upload, and when I attach it to an email, I have to go looking for it, I like to make a copy and put it in my upload folder so that, well, my email always pulls from my upload folder, so it saves me a lot of time and effort each time I need to attach something to the email. So you might save this in not only your QR, but also your uh, uploads folder. I keep doing that 0501. Let's go ahead with that. Click Save. And then that way, upload is a great way to actually keep all of the files that you have going out, going in different places. You can see I've got a bunch of title cards. I should probably clean this up because I'm done uploading those. But I've also got my submission right here so that when I attach it to my email, I just go to my upload folder and it's the only VDF in there, at least I hope. And it's the only one with that title. One other thing though, if you do the upload folder approach and not the QR one, you will need to delete this file also when it comes to our deadline. But this is a little bit on standard operating procedures that have worked very well. Now, if you've got a computer that isn't as powerful, we've had ones that it takes better part of 15 minutes to start STK back up. Maybe you don't wanna do it every hour, balance it based on your experience and what you think is best for your team. So that's part one. All right, now we're going to take a look at part two, the first of several suggestions that Stellar had to get you all completely prepared or as best prepared as possible for QR1. So the next one that we want to take a look at is uh, Stellar mentioned that they want you all to be aware of the ability to find range data. In other words, how far one object is from another. Now there are a couple things that I want to recommend on this, the first of which is probably just pulling that data straight out. So for instance, uh, I've got a scenario here that we'll be taking a look at. It's weather-based where we have targets that might be subject to hurricanes scattered around the world. And we're going to see why I've set that up for some of our other functions that we need to take a look at. But I've got one main satellite called BoomerSat that actually has our scanner that we want to actually scan targets. And it needs to be able to get information back to the National Weather Center in Oklahoma. That's NWC. Well, one thing that we might want for that is maybe there's a range limitation. Maybe if Boomersat is really, really far away, its transmitter isn't powerful enough to get the signal back to uh, the National Weather Center. So it might be worth being able to pull up our range data. Okay, it's actually super simple. It's a pre-made uh, thing that is so commonly asked for that it won't take long to find it in SDK. So I'm gonna to go to Boomersat, I'm gonna right click on it, and I'm gonna to go to Access, just like we would do to find the times that they can communicate. Well, if I want to find the range between Boomersat and the National Weather Center, I'm gonna click, we've got our access for Boomersat, and then we want it to see our range information for the National Weather Center. So I'm gonna click Compute, we see that it's run through all the calculations for uh, accesses. Normally we would click on reports and access, but there's one underneath it called AER. Now AER, as we're about to see, I'm gonna click here, is our azimuth, elevation, and range. I'm gonna make this a little bit overly simplistic, but in short, azimuth is basically uh, how much you look left or right. It's measured in degrees. 
Elevation is how much you look up or down, and range is going to be how far out you are. If you're familiar with it, this is basically a spherical coordinate system. It's a way of keeping track of things in three dimensions. We've got our range is our radial direction. Our azimuth is what we normally refer to as the polar uh, angle. And then elevation is, I forget the fancy term, but that's the angle as measured from the vertical, for want of a better term. I'm not going to go into too much of that, but the important thing is, here's how you find the range between these two objects. We see it quoted here. And we've got that on 20 October 2023 at 1700, uh, we've got this information. Now it's 1701, 1702, 1703, and so forth. Um, so when you look at that, here's where we can pull that information. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close that out. That's where we can actually double check on the range. I don't know what they're going to have you do with that information. It might be that you get some bonuses, for instance, if the satellite is close, so that if it's not too far away with range, maybe you're going to get more points, but it's okay to be farther away, you have a weaker signal, and I don't know exactly what they'll do with it. But I am gonna show you one additional thing which might prove useful since we're talking about ranges. Let's say that they go in and they say, okay, well, Boomer Satellite has only a specific range. I don't know, maybe 5,000 kilometers. And so even if it can see the National Weather Center, it will not be able to communicate with it if it's greater than 5,000 kilometers away. I don't know, I'm just throwing out a number here. But if that's the case, well, if you don't know about the next thing I'm going to show you, then the best that you can do is adjust your orbits and then bring up that ARE and look to make certain that your range doesn't really ever exceed the 5,000 kilometers. But there's something else you can do. Let's go over to Boomersat and let's say that we know that it's the one that has a limitation of 5,000 kilometers. Now, I want to be careful on this because they might say, no, actually, it's the National Weather Center's receiver that only has that range. So make certain you're keeping track of which one's which. But let's go to properties. Just like we would to change our orbital values, we can actually go further down. Real quick, since we're here, you can go on attributes and you can actually change the color of this thing. Uh, that's under 2D graphics. Go down past 3D graphics and one thing that we want to take a look at are constraints. Let's go to basic. On basic, we've got azimuth, elevation, and hey, look at this, range, minimum and maximum. You can actually program in an acceptable range. Basically, it's saying, hey, STK, for this satellite, it can only see, let's say that we've got a telescope on there, that it's like binoculars. If you put binoculars in front of your face and hold up a paper, like a newspaper, if those still exist, and you try and read like a book or a newspaper, you won't be able to because it's way too close. You need something to be a minimum distance away in order for your telescope or your binoculars to be able to focus on it. Let's say that you have a minimum range of 1,000 kilometers. And a maximum range, things get super fuzzy after 10,000 kilometers. So, oh, that's 1,000, 10,000 kilometers. Apply. And now when I do this, you can go ahead and double check the range report. It'll still give you the actual ranges, but if you're looking to make certain that, hey, the computer is no longer counting anything, that your satellite is too far from the source to be able to actually communicate, you can put that in as a constraint and then the computer will do a bunch of the math for you. Anyway, something to think about on that. Okay, that's the main stuff that I can think of that I wanna get you prepared for the idea of range. Now we're back to take a look at part three. The second thing that's recommended, lighting time. Well, lighting times are exceedingly important for a lot of our satellite operations for a variety of reasons. It gives you an idea when your target is actually lit up by the sun or not. Now, there are three things that you need to know, uh, at least starting off. There are three possibilities. There is direct light, which is, hey, you're in broad daylight. There's penumbra, which is basically sunrise or sunset, your partial sunlight. And then there is umbra, which is complete darkness. In other words, you don't have any sunlight that's coming out on you. Okay, so one primary place where we see this is to make certain that your solar panels are actually getting enough power. The solar panels only generate power for your satellite when they are in sunlight. So let's start there. Let's go to my satellite, Boomersat, and I'm going to right click on it, and I want to go down to Report and Graph Manager. Okay, so I'm going to click on this. 
there's actually a whole bunch of reports in here and you can create custom ones though I got to tell you when you create the custom ones there are a bunch of functions to actually go looking through that being said we're going to go through and we are going to take a look at one of the main ones that we're looking for, which is lighting times. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Lighting times report is one of the main ones that I want. Oh, uh, normally, I forgot I checked this earlier in a part that I had to delete. Uh, there's usually graphs in here as well, which you could also take a look at for the lighting times report or graph. If you want to clear it up, if you're looking for the reports, uncheck graphs. And if you're looking for the graphs, the other way. We'll start off with the lighting times and actually take a look at those. So I'm going to click on lighting times report and I'm going to click generate. Okay, now this thing has a lot of information and by default it is organized that it will give you all sunlight times. So for my boomer sat, it enters sunlight on 20 October 2023 at 1700 hours and leaves at 1755 with a duration of this many seconds. Seconds. I guess while we're, while we're here. Right click on the duration in seconds. Usually Stellar is doing a good job of actually switching it to useful ones, but I'm gonna to go to duration and units, and I can switch this over as, let's see, set units, uh, second. Oh, use default, so I'm going to uncheck this. Let's go over and apply this as minutes, and I'm going to click set as default. Okay, now when I bring this up in the future, it'll bring it up in minutes. You don't have to do that, but I find staring at seconds is a little confusing. Maybe you want this in hours, though minutes are usually a good approach. I can see that in my satellite is in sunlight for about 56 minutes at the beginning. It would actually be more like 102 minutes. You'll notice that there's a lot of pattern here, a bunch of hundreds and twos, then hundreds and ones, and so forth. This one would be 102, but this is it starts at the beginning of the scenario, so we were partway through its time in the daylight. Okay. But this is our sunlight times. Now with these timestamps, you could also figure out when it's not in sunlight. But if you scroll down to the bottom of the sunlight times, we have statistics. The minimum duration, or the minimum time in the sun was 41.35 minutes. And our maximum duration was 102. Those might be useful in some scenarios. Your average duration is about 99 minutes. And your total duration, which is another useful thing, and often the number you're looking for, but not always, is 6852.7. But when you get to the bottom of the sunlight, the direct light times, we've also got penumbra. Now, what's penumbra? I mentioned that it's like sunrise and sunset. I'm going to minimize this real quick. The sun, oops, the sun is behind me in my 3D view right now. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch around so that we can start to see it. All right, now the sun is not a point source. It's actually got a relative size, maybe about the size of your thumb at the fully extended arm length but it has an angular size. And as a result, here's what I can do. As I start to go around the planet, I may have it where I can still see part of the sun, but not all of it. I'm in partial sunlight. That's penumbra. You're also gonna notice that the penumbra times happen very quickly, because basically we're full sunlight here, we can see the entire sun. We're penumbra here, where we can only see part of the sun, maybe two thirds of the sun. Uh, maybe a quarter of the sun, and then over here, we can't see any of the sun. We are now in umbra. So when you take a look at this report, you're going to see that our penumbra times are all really, really short. Look, 0 0.3 minutes, basically. And that's because it doesn't take long for your satellite to swing through what you could call sunrise or sunset. Okay, penumbra probably isn't what you're looking for. Umbra times might also be important, too. This is when you are in complete darkness. And we can see that our umbral times, we've got timestamps for each of those, and we've got a duration of 24 minutes. We can go down, we can get the full time on that, but this can also give you an idea of patterns. It can be difficult to work with all of these numbers because there's a whole bunch of them, and this scenario is only one week long. But one thing that we can take a look at is by looking at these values and also scrolling down to the mean value, I can say that on average, my satellite is in sunlight for 99.3 minutes. Let's call it 100 to make it a nicer number to deal with. It's in penumbra on average for maybe about 0 0.3, yeah, 0 0.298 or 0 0.3 minutes. Okay, and then it's in darkness for on average about 25.689. We could call that 26 minutes. So if you're going through and you're trying to balance your power in a power budget, Instead of doing all the in-depth analysis on it, you can look at your patterns and say, okay, well on average, I would get 
a hundred minutes of sunlight coming in and I would have about 26 minutes of no sunlight coming in and being able to do that would give you a pretty good representation of your sunlight. Okay, a couple things that I want to finish up on this. First off, that was the report. Let's go over and see it a different way. Uh, let's see, quick report, or sorry, report and graph manager. Oh, it's minimized here. Let's see, show the graphs instead of the reports. And I'm gonna go down to lighting times, or I'm gonna to try to, and then it's gonna move on me. Generate. This one actually brings up a graph where you can actually see, okay, umbra, we've got that little box right there. Penumbra are gonna be super small. And then we've got our sunlight actually here. So here's a way that you can see things visually. Okay, one other thing that I'll bring up on this because it was useful uh, in some ones that we have seen. Uh, that's the lighting times report. You could just go straight to uh, things like penumbra start, penumbra stop, or penumbra, where you could select just the, the one of those instead of having all three, but usually it's pretty nice to have all three of them. We have the same thing for umbra. We probably got one for sunlight, but I usually just go to the lighting times. The other one that I want you to be aware of that we know has possibly come in handy in the past, not just lighting, but we've also got eclipse summary. This is one where you can actually pull information and eclipse times of when an object goes behind another object. In fact, I'll go ahead and click this, generate the report. It'll also tell you, among other things, the current condition, worst condition, and it will tell you what object you are actually being eclipsed by. In this case, it's the Earth for all of them, but it might not always be the Earth. I don't think that one's going to be terribly useful, but I wanted to let you know that that is in there. If nothing else, if you have some downtime, not usually during the QR, but it doesn't necessarily hurt to read through some of the installed styles of the reports. There might be a report that's already built into SDK that has a lot of information that might prove useful for you. All right, the last thing I'm gonna bring up is this. Same type of thing, although often we probably wouldn't wanna have it on the satellite, though maybe, maybe the satellite just shuts down whenever it's not in sunlight. But what if your sensor is actually a camera? Okay, well, we could take a picture of Miami, for instance, because it's daylight, but if it's a regular camera, if I were over Mumbai right now, I wouldn't really be able to see much of anything because it's dark. Well, one of the things that I can then do is I can go in and I can say, okay, Mumbai, I am going to go to properties and I'm going to go down to constraints. Well, we have basic for range and all of that stuff, but we also have sun. On here, there's one that says lighting. We can click on lighting and we can limit it that it is only functioning in direct sunlight or only in penumbra when it's sunrise or sunset. We can also do penumbra and direct light or combinations with umbra. So you could have it where we could set up direct sun and basically set up for a real life application of a camera that says, well, if it's midnight, I'm not gonna be able to get any useful pictures. I need it to be sunny out. Well set up a constraint that your target that needs to be sunny is only accessible during direct sunlight by using this. I'm gonna uncheck that, but it's a thing that you could do. All right, that's the main things that I can think of when it comes to lighting times and how you might end up using them. Though I will show you at the end of this, because this is going to get super long it feels like, but how you can export those files and if you needed to do something more than just going off of, hey, it's about 100 minutes in sunlight and about 26 minutes in darkness, if you needed something more precise, I'll show you how to do that towards the end of this video. We're back again for yet another part of what we wanna take a look at. Hopefully this one's gonna go pretty a lot faster. They also advised us that we should get you up to date on the relationship between apogee, perigee, and period. Now period is the time it takes for the satellite to do one complete orbit. So I could press play on this, and this starts at 1700 hours, and I'm gonna let the satellite zip around the planet. There it goes. We'll see you on the far side, Boomer Sat. We're at 1800 hours, 1830. And then now, as the satellite is coming back, it's about where it started, and we're at 1909 hours. So we got 1909 hours. That's about two hours later, which means the period for my satellite is about two hours. Okay, now one of the things that I'm going to mention on this, let's go to properties for Boomer Sat. I've currently got a orbit, a circular orbit of 2,000 kilometers for both my apogee and my perigee. 
Kepler's third law of planetary motion tells us that the size of the orbit, represented by something called the semi-major axis, which is basically how big the orbit is, is directly related through a series of constants that we don't need to talk about right now, to the orbital period, in other words, how long it will take to do one complete rotation. So that's one of the reasons why, okay, well, originally the classical elements are the semi-major axis, which controls the size of your orbit, the eccentricity, which for zero, that's a circular orbit, or I could do something like 0 0.5. Between zero and one, we get an elliptical orbit, an oval, and for values greater than one, we start going into parabolas and hyperbolas. I apologize about that, scam likely. I'm just going to turn my phone off real quick, hopefully. Okay, back on track. This is the classical way to actually define our orbits. In fact, on Stellar, a lot of times when they ask you to submit your uh, orbital information, they'll ask you for your semi-major axis, eccentricity, and then the inclination, the argument of perigee, ran, and so forth. So we're hopefully very used to apogee altitude at perigee altitude, less so with semi-major axis, but semi-major axis gives us the size and eccentricity gives us the shape. Well, those are actually another way of expressing apogee and perigee, because if we put apogee and perigee at the same distance out, well, clearly we can control the size of the orbit with that, but by making them different values, we can also change the shape. That's why they're just a different way of working with the semi-major axis and the eccentricity. By the same token, the orbital period is tied only to the size of your orbit. So as we change the size of our orbit, we'll change our period. But because the period is also directly related to the size of the orbit, we can also do the following. Let's do a drop down. There's semi-major axis, there's apogee radius, where that's measured from the center of the Earth, apogee altitude, which is measured from the surface of the Earth, and usually much easier. Hey, look at that. There's an option that says period. Uh, by default, it's once again in seconds. Let's go over here, and I'm going to change this to, I don't know, minutes. Or I could even do hours. Hey, look at that. I said that it was slightly over an hour that we had the satellite, come, or sorry, slightly over two hours that we got the satellite to come back. And we can see that our orbital period is in fact about 2.12 hours. So our satellite will orbit every two hours, or a little over every two hours. Now I can go through and I can try and adjust things here with that particular setting. I can try and make this straight up two hours. Okay. With my eccentricity being zero, that's actually fine. It just made my orbit a little smaller. Let's take a look. So now I'm not as high up. You may have seen it in the background there. I'm gonna bring this back up. And now that I've made this change, that's 7,200 seconds, jerk. Okay, uh, apogee altitude. To get a two hour orbit, apparently I need a circular orbit of 1,680.86 kilometers. So with this, I could have it that my orbit completes every two hours. Well, that's great because if I know that my target comes by every three hours, maybe I want to go through and come in under period and bump this up to three hours. You should be able to go in and actually change the default units on this. I don't want this video to get even longer, so I'm just going to show you the basics on this, but you could go through and change the default units. I'm going to click apply. That's 10,800 seconds. Great. And now I can do my drop down. For a circular orbit, I would have 4,182.14 kilometers as a circular orbit. And now my orbit comes around every three hours. Now you may be tempted to try and make a one hour orbit. Go ahead, give it a try, but you're gonna crash your satellite into the planet. The International Space Station is at an altitude of about 400 kilometers or so, give or take. That puts it a bit above the atmosphere, and so you're avoiding drag there, and if you start getting much closer than that, you'll have trouble staying in orbit for the most part. And the orbital period for the International Space Station is about 93 minutes. It's about an hour and a half. So I keep that in mind that even if you get a satellite super close to the Earth, about the lowest you can make your period, how long it will take to go around, is about an hour and a half, give or take. Now, because apogee altitude and perigee altitude together change the size of our orbit and therefore will directly affect our semi-major axis, they will also change the period. So we can go through and let's say that I want a more elliptical orbit and I'm going to have my perigee drop down to, I don't know, maybe 3,000 kilometers. In fact, let's make this even closer, 4,000 kilometers. So I'm only dropping it down by about 200. Okay, apply. 
So now I've got a slightly elliptical orbit. I'm going to go back over to my period and we can see, oh wait, because I've adjusted the size of the orbit, it's not three hours exactly anymore, it's now 2.9612. We can also see, because it's not a circular orbit, we now have a non-zero eccentricity. Eccentricities close to zero are going to look pretty circular. In fact, I've only slightly adjusted it. When we zoom out, you could be forgiven for thinking that it's still a circular orbit. And this one is so close to a circular orbit that you basically have to look at the numbers to know for sure. But in short, this is something that you could use to possibly take advantage of periodicity, which is a fancy term, but it basically means there are patterns in the times. And that's a great thing to keep track of in these space mission designs because of the way our universe works, a lot of these things are actually going to follow patterns. So there might be ways, that, or specifically patterns in time, so there might be a way to use your period to actually take advantage of that. All right. And we're back. Taking a look at the last of the main suggestions that we received from Stellar X to prepare for QR1. This one's gonna be a little bit longer. We're gonna talk about both chains and constellations together. They kind of overlap in some of their applications, though they are very different things. A lot of times if you're doing one of them, you're probably going to end up doing another one. Not necessarily, but most of the time. I do recommend the video that they have on the training materials for Stellar X. It's about 15 minutes long. Mine will probably be a little bit longer, but they show you the basics of chains and constellations. And that being said, I'm going to do my best to try and give you an overview of that here, but it doesn't hurt to make certain that you're more comfortable with them. Chains and constellations have shown up in a lot of our much more complex scenarios. They don't always show up in QR1. They don't always show up in semifinals, though they are far more likely to show up in semifinals. I have the suspicion that they show up a lot at nationals because this is actually a very important function for satellite technology. Okay, let's talk about using a chain. Uh, so I've set this up. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the scenario that we've been looking at because it looks very complex and I've only checked a couple of things. In short, the idea is this. The National Weather Center has set up a satellite to actually monitor hurricane conditions in uh, hurricane prone areas around the world or cyclone or s storms, depressions, whatever. I'm not a meteorologist, but we've got several different targets. Miami, San Salvador, uh, Mumbai, Bangkok, Manila, and Hong Kong. So these are all places where uh, in areas that are active with hurricanes, particularly around this time of year. So the National Weather Service in Norman, Oklahoma, I have set up that they are going to put a satellite in orbit, hence why it's called Boomersat, Boomer Sooner, or whatever. We have also included in here, because this is one thing that is not included in Stellar X's training, and I wanted to make certain that you see this because recently, without naming anything in great detail, one of our scenarios that we saw actually had a sensor built into it. Now in the training video that they have on the Stellar X website, which is an absolutely wonderful one, it gives you a breakdown on how to work with chains and constellations, but it doesn't actually show you how to deal with a chain along with a sensor. And I have a little bit of experience with that, so I wanted to make certain that you saw this just in case we need that added level of complexity. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, we're going to say that Boomersat is the satellite that has a sensor that is called the HAWS. I wrote that down somewhere, but I think it's High Altitude Weather Sensor. And so I'm abbreviating it as HAWS, just a way to keep track of it. Fine. But it has a cone angle, a half cone angle of 10 degrees, making a little spotlight here. Now we would go through, I haven't written this up as a full scenario, but you would normally have things where it's like, hey, your apogee is li limited to this 6,000 kilometers up, and your perigee is limited to 200 kilometers up to avoid scraping the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to actually want to go through that because this isn't a full scenario, at least not yet. But the idea on this is we want to have it where our scanner, our Haas sensor, is going to take a look at each one of these targets and try and collect weather data at those locations so that we can study the causes of or the effects of hurricanes a little bit better. But there's one downside. The way that I set this up, I'm going to hand wave this as an explanation, but Boomersat has no hard drive space available for this project. Or 
has no hard drive at all, although that's less believable. In other words, what we need is when Boomersat is scanning, we need it to get that information back to the National Weather Center at that time. It can't hold on to it to then send it back later. Now you may be thinking, well, that sounds a little silly. Um, what this is probably better representing is, let's say that this isn't actually a weather sensor, but it's actually a satellite phone uh, receiver. And maybe you have someone that's in Miami and they want to use the satellite phone to talk to someone at the National Weather Center. Well, it means that the satellite has to have contact with both of the targets at the same time. You can't just send your message up to the satellite and be like, hey, I'm gonna leave this voicemail, get back to me whenever you can. Well, you can do that. But for satellite communications and a bunch of other things, including the uh, network broadcast that they had as a sample for the Stellar one, there are a lot of great reasons why you want instantaneous contact between two targets. And that is where a chain comes in. Okay, now I've set up my orbit when I load this up, where Boomersat is just before hitting the Miami target. So if I step forward a little bit, we can see a short time into my scenario, we begin scanning the Miami target. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why I've gone to that trouble to make certain that that's the thing. But here's what we want. We want to make certain, and I heavily recommend that you might draw this out, say on your whiteboard that has uh, your objective on it, because this is an objective that starts to get a little bit more complex and it's easy to get lost in the detail. I recommend thinking about what you're actually after. We're after the data from Miami, but we need to get it back to the weather center. So if I were to draw this out, I would start off with, I wish I had actually brought up like PowerPoint and done the drawing, but I'm gonna continue with this because the video is gonna be long enough already. But I want you to imagine that I've got a little dot on my whiteboard that says Miami, maybe on a planet Earth or something like that. I have a satellite, Boomersat, with a spotlight that is then shining downward, and I draw an arrow from the spotlight over to Miami. Or Sorry, I draw an arrow from Miami over to the spotlight. And the other thing about this is keep track of your direction. Directions are important. Where does your vital information for this scenario start? And that's why I really want to emphasize, if you're new to this, you may not have paid close attention to actually getting in the mindset of what your scenario is. Well, there are a lot of scenarios that on the simple side where it's just, okay, uh, satellite's trying to see this thing and you're just trying to maximize the time. That is not what you're doing here. While we are trying to maximize time, we've got some other things that we have to balance. Okay, but think about what it is we're after. We're after the data that is here at Miami, for instance, or San Salvador, or any of the targets, but let's focus on Miami first. I need that data to go up to the satellite, Boomersat, through our sensor. So I need, I could imagine it here as I move this forward, here's a spot where we are scanning Miami the information is going up to Boomersat through our sensor. Now, Boomersat needs to get that back down to the National Weather Center. That's where a chain is going to be very important. It isn't just, hey, let's open it up and see if Boomersat, uh, what the time that it has contacting Miami is. It's also got to be able to contact the National Weather Center at the same time. That may not be the entire overlap there. Okay, so here's what we can do. I'm gonna go up to Weathering Heights, which is the name of this scenario, because it's weather and it's heights and it sounds like a thing. Kids love puns, leave me alone. I'm going to do insert. Let's go, I like to do default object. I think they use a more rigorous approach in the Stellar X sample. A lot of times I don't know what settings to use, so I like to just use a default object when I put things in. I'm gonna put in a chain, okay. Chains, it's important to be able to visualize your links, which is why I heavily recommend drawing this out. For me, I would start with my information is at Miami. Then that I would have an arrow that would go over to Haas, the Haas sensor, not Boomersat, because it isn't just when the satellite can see Miami, I need it when we have the sensor that can see it. And then I need the sensor, well, the satellite, I should say, which the sensor is on, to send the information back to the weather center. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to chain. I add in a chain, I'm gonna give this a name. So I'm gonna click on this so I can change its name. I'm going to say Miami to National Weather Center. Give it a useful name. Depending on the complexity of your scenario, you might have to make several chains. So being able to keep track of them is going to be very important. Okay. 
Now that I've got my chain, it's created a named, but it doesn't do anything yet. I need to right click, go to properties. Here is where you want to have that visual that I keep describing and I unfortunately did not make, but go through your order. So we start with Miami. So I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna find target Miami and I'm going to, hey, it added it over as an, an object. Oops, I'm gonna remove one of them because I guess I double clicked on it or something. But normally you click on it and you click this over arrow and it will add it to assigned objects. Okay, you need to go in order. Our information starts at Miami, so that's the first one I want to list on the chain. Because basically the chain's going to go from one step to another each step as we go. Then I'm going to go through and I need that information to be picked up by the Haas sensor, so I'm going to add that over here. And then I need that information to get back to the National Weather Center, so I'm going to add that there. Great, I'm going to click apply. And then I'm going to show you how to do this. Hint, hint, I made a mistake. The first time I learned how to do this, I did exactly what you saw here, and I was confused for a little bit. And that's the other thing that I'm gonna bring up with this part that I wanna draw your attention to. Okay, now that we've got a chain, you need to right click on the chain and go to chain compute accesses. Okay, and then I'm going to go to right click report and graph manager. We talked about that in an earlier part of the video, but that's fine. Uh, I want to see the report, you could also see the graph, but we're looking for the one called Complete Chain Access. Oh, well that's interesting. It says no access found. Okay, so you might think, well we've got a crappy orbit, I gotta go back in and make some adjustments on this, but that's why I mentioned that I set this up so that I could have it where right now, Boomersat is scanning the target Miami Sorry, my mouse keeps uh, double clicking when it should single click. Yes, I, I'm familiar with that mouse, thank you. But the satellite should very much be able to see the National Weather Center. So I should actually have access here. That's what I ended up doing. Go through and double check that your tools are giving you reasonable numbers. Right now this one's saying that there is no access found. That was actually my clue that I've done something wrong because right now I'm looking at something that this should very much have access. So I'm gonna go back to what I had set up. I'm gonna minimize my total chain or my complete chain access. And I'm going to go back over to how I defined my chain properties. Oh, it's right down here. I'm gonna bring this back up. There's something I forgot. Okay, look at the assigned objects and actually follow the logic. We have information that starts at the target Miami, goes up to the sensor, and then the next step is National Weather Center. So what STK is thinking is the sensor, that little cone, needs to see both Miami and the National Weather Center because there's nothing in between. But we don't actually need the sensor to see nor the uh, weather center. We just need the satellite that that sensor is on. Well, I can go over to Boomersat and I'm going to add that in. Although now it's out of order because, once again, think about it. It's not just add the items on there. Our information starts in Miami. It gets picked up by Haas, so that needs to be next. And then Haas gives that information, because it's connected to the satellite, to Boomersat. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move Boomersat up. And then Boomersat will then send that information back to the, the National Weather Center. So I'm going to click Apply. And let's see what that does. Report. Complete chain access. I refresh and all of a sudden we actually have times. Look at that. In fact, one of them begins at 1701.45 and ends at 17.03. Well, let's see, we're at 1700. I start moving over and we get, there we go. The moment it comes in range, 1701.50, at least with our step size, we can see I begin scanning Miami. I've got a contact for my chain that comes up to Boomersat and Boomersat can see the National Weather Center, so it relays that information. It continues going, it can still see both of them, and then, bam, we lose our chain access. So now we know it's doing it correctly. I'm gonna back it up just a little bit. It defaulted to white. You can also go in, just like we did with previous things, and go properties, oh, that's right down here, and you can then go to uh, 2D graphics and change your color in here. So if I wanted to make it, I don't know, uh, yellow, maybe it, it connects better. Click OK. We can see it's yellow now. OK, great. OK, so that's one big thing that I wanted to emphasize, because while they have a very good video that shows you the idea of chains, 
It's probably a little bit shorter than mine, yes, but they only made reference to you might have a sensor in there. And I gotta tell you, maybe you're smarter than I am, but I didn't catch it the first time. And what I showed you initially was exactly what I did, and I got super confused that I never had contact time. So while it wasn't the best orbit, and I do heavily recommend this, adjust your orbit so that you can try and find one of them that you know should work. And if it says that you're not getting anything, well, then you've got a problem somewhere and you need to track it down. Well, that's exactly what I did, and that's how I was able to figure out what I had overlooked, that the sensor needs to talk to the satellite so that the satellite can talk to the weather center. Well, that's super easy because the sensor is connected to the satellite, but I need the satellite in there to get that relay done. Speaking of relay, well, first off, one of the things that I want to bring up on this is the other part of what we want to take a look at, which is constellations. Now, one of the things that I would have for this is the Weather Center wants to try and get as much time as it can from Miami, San Salvador, all of the targets. And you could go through and set up a chain for each one of them, Miami to the Weather Center, San Salvador to the Weather Center, and all the others, but now you're going to end up with like 80 chains over here. Okay, fine, it's like six, but even still, you're going to end up with a bunch of stuff and it's going to make things even more confusing. All the more important to make certain that you name things well. I'm going to go back over to weathering heights and I'm going to insert yet another object. As a side note, what you click on over here will affect what you can insert effectively. So I want to add something new to the entire scenario, not just to a satellite or to a facility. You could add things like sensors or transmitters or receivers. But I want to insert one other thing. Default object, I'm going to go with a constellation. So what is a constellation? Here's what I'm going to do. Well, first off, I can actually define it. Again, the double click comes in. I want to rename it first. For me, I know that I am going to put all of my targets into one constellation. Instead of having it where I'm looking at Miami in one chain and San Salvador in another chain and yet another chain for Mumbai, why don't I use something called a constellation, which for the most part in SDK is basically saying, okay, I'm going to put all of these items in a box and anytime you have contact with any part of that box, count that. In other words, it keeps track of all the individual things like Miami and San Salvador and all of those, but it's going to add all of them together just into, hey, if I put all those things in the box, I can find the total contact time from that box. So here's what I can do. All right, so uh, I want to add my targets into this target one. Well, you can actually filter by different things up here, facilities, satellite, sensor. You can click targets and you can actually add all of your targets at once. But maybe there are some targets that you don't want in there. That's okay. I can unclick targets and I could remove Bangkok, for instance, but leave the others. Not, no reason to do that. So I'm going to put Bangkok back in. But now when I click apply, I have a constellation of targets that is basically, hey, whenever I, con I can contact one of them, I want you to keep track of that time. Don't necessarily care if it's Miami or San Salvador. At the end of the day, I want to total those values. Now, if I need specifically Miami or San Salvador, I can go back to the original chains that we talked about. Well, the thing about constellations are we won't actually be able to pull their access times like another object. We're going to have to go in and make yet another chain. So, weathering heights. This is also why chains and constellations kind of get covered together. If you want contact time with your chain, or sorry, with your constellation, then you're going to need to actually make a chain to go along with it. I'm going to call this one Targets to NWC. Again, give it a good name. Okay, so now I'm going to go in Properties, and this time, instead of adding each of the individual things, I've got this constellation. I'm going to say anytime it starts with a target, we can then have it go, uh, Haas is going to scan that, then Haas needs to talk to Boomersat, and then Boomersat needs to return that information to the National Weather Center. So I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to Targets to NWC. I'm going to go to Compute Accesses, and now I can go to Report and Graph Manager. And as a quick side note, after you find it the first time, there's a little arrow here because I brought up the complete chain access report earlier. You may have to find it the very first time, but after that, there's a good bet that there's a shortcut to it because it's the one that you used. And when I scroll down here, I end up with my total chain access 
for all of my targets with this particular orbit. It's not the best orbit in the world. So that's where I could go through and start making it better. But my total contact time is 2,158, as opposed to back when I had only Miami in there. Let's see what we had on that. Ooh, uh, is that, I think I've got it minimized somewhere. I apologize. But we've got 2,158, I'm gonna close this and then I'm going to try and bring that back up again because it may have had trouble loading it up. I'm gonna do compute accesses in case I had cleared them by accident. Complete chain access and we've got only 1,641. Now, one of the things that I'll bring up is, well, that's still a large amount uh, right now because of Boomersat. It's only going to return data from Miami and San Salvador because whenever it's able to scan Mumbai or Bangkok, that satellite definitely will not be able to see the National Weather Center, which brings us to one of the last things that I've set up. You see the three satellites out in a pretty high Earth orbit, maybe not exactly high Earth orbit, but I put them out there a decent way so that hopefully when we go around and we're on the back side of the planet, maybe this, our boomer sat can scan one of these, bounce it off of one of these relay satellites, and the relay satellite could then get it to uh, NWC. I might need to put them farther out. I don't want to sink a whole lot of time into it, but I wanted to give you the idea of, oh, that's a thing that we could probably do. We could have what's called relay satellites. We have a bunch of satellites in the uh, geosynchronous orbits that are actually pretty good for this sort of thing. But let me show you how we would do that. So weathering heights, we'll go in, insert another default object, and I'm going to insert yet another constellation. Because this time, what I want to do is, I could set it up where Boomersat has to bounce off of my relay satellites, I, all na I name them all Echo, Echo 1, Echo 2, and Echo 3, because they're basically going to hear something and repeat it back over to the target. They're gonna serve as what's called a repeater. All right, I'm going to go through and call this constellation Echoes, easy way to keep track of it. And I'm going to go to Properties, and I'm going to add in Echo 1, Echo 2, and Echo 3, apply. Okay, so the last thing that I can do on this is weathering heights. Again, med imagine out what you want to do. Let's do another chain, insert. Uh, let's see, I need to give this a useful name. Targets, echoes. This is the one that's going to be all of the stuff together. Properties. Okay, here's where it starts to get tricky. I need targets as my first spot. That's where the data is coming from. I put that over. Then I need the sensor to scan those targets. So it's the next thing. Then Boomersat. And then I need Boomersat to bounce that off of one of the echoes. So I'm going to take the echoes group. And then the echoes group will send this to the National Weather Center. Click apply. All right. We can see that we've got several of my relay satellites. We can see some lines coming in automatically in that Boomersat is actually able to bounce that back. Now, while we have two satellites that are doing that, I don't think it will double count the results, though you might go through and double check. So here's what I'm gonna do. I think it already computed the accesses, but doesn't hurt to tell it to do that. And then we do complete chain access. And now we can see that I end up with, hopefully some more time, we end up with 3,000 min or seconds instead of the 2500 that we had before now i can work on my orbit for boomersat to try and use this relay network to get that information back to the national weather center after we scan it okay so this is chains and constellations and some advanced applications of them in case you might need to do some of that All right, this one isn't actually listed on there, but I have a suspicion based on some of the things that we've seen somewhat recently that it might be good to go ahead and get this particular skill on your radar rather than waiting for afterwards. So I'm going to be proactive on this. Now, this is not something that they actually warned us about that we need to have you all ready for. But without going into great detail, a scenario that we saw recently involved you scanning one object and trying to get that information back to somewhere else that is looking for that information. Well, that's a lot like the scenario that I've got here, where we're trying to t scan given targets, Miami, San Salvador, and so forth, and get that information back to the National Weather Center. 
Now again, I'm not actually solving this one or doing any of the work on that. That's your job. That's the stuff you get to play around with. I just want to show you the tools and methods that you can use so that you can get the most out of the efforts that you're putting in. There's one last one that I want to take a look at, partly because of the idea of scanning to get information and sending that information back to somewhere that needs it. And also, a lot of times the same skill might prove useful when you're dealing with lighting times, depending on what you need the lighting times for. Again, if it's just, hey, we're taking a picture while something's got sunlight on it, then you wouldn't necessarily need that. But what I mentioned before, although it usually shows up in PR2 and QR2, maybe we have to tackle it some early that we need to take a look at. For satellites, their lighting time is a lot of times very important to make certain that they have enough power to get the job done. And as a result, it can be worthwhile, while it's great being able to say that the average, say, time period, say, in the sun is 100 minutes, Sometimes it's shorter and sometimes it's longer. So if you need exactly 98 minutes, well, on average, you're fine. But you might be a little under and you might end up going into safe mode, which would be super duper bad. Okay, that's another place where this can apply. But I'm going to jump straight to the slightly more complex of scanning one target, getting information from it, and trying to get it back to another place. So for instance, right now, in fact, let's go ahead and bring up a couple of the access reports that we're going to need. I need access between Boomersat and the National Weather Center. So I'm going to click Compute. I can see that we filled in our little lines. Hey, we've got some, ah, uh, double click. Uh, let's see, we've got some uh, contact information. I'm gonna to go to my reports and I'm going to go to Access. Wonderful. Okay, so I've got my total duration in seconds because I kept forgetting to change the default units on this. I'm gonna bump that up to use defaults. I'm gonna do set as default. And let's put that over into, I don't know, minutes. That might prove a little bit useful. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go minutes and then I've got that. And I can see that my total contact time is say a thousand minutes. Okay, great. The other thing that I need, and I could go over to it and right click and do the access, but I've already got the access menu up. I don't want Boomersat necessarily. I want Haas, so I'm gonna select that as my central one. And I want to see it, I don't know, scanning Miami. So I'm gonna click compute on that. I can generate the access report on that one. And I've got two different access reports. Now you'll notice that it came up in minutes this time because I clicked those extra buttons to change the default to something so that I didn't have to do it each and every time. Now I've only got 27 minutes right now with this particular orbit, especially since one of them is line of sight and the others through a tiny little scanner. You're probably gonna have plenty of time one way or the other. But let's imagine that this were a little more open-ended. Uh, and that you had, um, say, one hour's worth of contact time with the weather center and one hour's worth of scanning time for Miami. And I'm going to take an extreme case on this. Well, if all of your contact time for uh, the weather center is on Thursday and all of your contact time for Miami was on Tuesday, then Miami happened first, you scanned the data, and let's say that you didn't have to immediately offload it, let's say that it saved it on a hard drive, and then when it sees the National Weather Center on Thursday, it goes, here is the data, we are happy. Well, that works out great so long as your target, which is the source of your information, comes first. But what if you have a total contact time of an hour for both of them, and you see the weather center on Tuesday, and you see Miami on Thursday. Well, when you see the weather center, you haven't scanned Miami yet, so you don't have anything useful to actually send them. And when you scan Miami, you'll get an hour's worth of time from Miami, but if that data never makes it back to the weather center, then you may not be getting any points for that. There are scenarios where you'd wanna keep track of that. And more importantly, it's a very real life application. So I'm gonna show you something here because staring at these, uh, that, that would be very difficult. You'd have to manually go through and say, okay, which one happens first and when? Like I gave the example of Tuesday and Thursday, but we can see from this, we've got things happening multiple times a day. And so hopefully we'd be able to get most of the stuff back, but we don't necessarily know for certain. And that's one of the last skills that I want to introduce to you on a bunch of these reports we've got a little button up here that says save as .csv. A .csv is a comma separated values file. It's a standard form. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to save my sensor scanning Miami as a CSV. Now I can put this 
wherever. I will warn you this, it will default to a folder that I think it has made in the STK files, which means finding it is going to be a terrible pain unless you do the standard operating procedures that I mentioned at the, admittedly, like a very long time ago, beginning of this video. Go to desktop, go over to QR1 or whatever your active folder is, and then you can save this right there. In fact, you could also go in so that you don't fill this up with uh, reports, create new folder right here, and I could name this Access Reports. And I can save it in there. I'm gonna go ahead and save it as whatever it's named. It gives you a warning that says, hey, basically, you, this is a really good file format, but it might be a little tricky to bring it into different uh, systems to use it. Excel is a classic one. Excel is absolutely wonderful for a variety of reasons, but not everyone has access to it. And if you're using things like a Chromebook, it makes it very difficult to use it. That being said, I'm going to show you Google Sheets because that's something that's pretty much available for anyone and fairly easy to use. And on top of that, for these CSVs, turns out Google Sheets is a little bit easier to load the data in, though it may not be able to do as much as Excel. Okay, so that's what this warning box is. Uh, I'm gonna click do not show this again because I'm already familiar with it. I'm gonna click okay. And then I now have my report for my sensor and Miami. So that's me getting information. I'm gonna go back down here to my minimized report. Here is my satellite to the facility. Here is me sending the information. I want both of those. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna click export and you don't have to find it each time. Just like with email or anything else, most things will keep track of the last folder that you were actually saving a likewise thing in, which is why the upload folder is going to be very useful. All right, I'm gonna click save here. Okay, great. So we've got all that. Now, two sheets. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, um, I've also opened up my folder here, QR1, where I'm saving all my files that I can delete later, because remember, these access reports are files related to your scenario. So if you do make them, we do need to delete them. So I'm gonna go down into my access reports, and that's where those are. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go into, I have a untitled spreadsheet in Google Sheets. So you can open this up by going to Google Sheets. I'm going to give this a useful name. Don't underestimate doing that so you don't end up with a thousand things called untitled sheets. And on top of that, this file must also be deleted by the time we need it deleted. So I'm gonna call this uh, weather, oops, weathering heights. Okay, I can make some tabs down here. On this one, I'm going to say uh, orbit one. I don't know, maybe I'm gonna try a series of different orbits, but I need some information. So here's what I'm <clears throat> going to do. Let's see, uh, I'm trying to remember where it is. I think it's under file and we are going to import. Here it is, go import. Now here's where having an upload folder is probably the better way for me to do this, but I don't want to micromanage and have to delete a bunch of stuff. So I'm gonna go to upload here. I could always drag those files in from my folder so I can grab them from here and drag them in or I can also go browse and go finding it if I need to. And because I use my upload folder so often, it's actually in the quick stuff. Also, I've been going into the QR1 quite a bit, so I'm gonna go straight to that. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna load in Haas. Okay, create new spreadsheet. You can do that. Uh, insert new sheet, replace spreadsheet, replace current spreadsheet. That seems fine. You, you've got a number of options there. Feel free to select those, uh, to play around with. Uh, separator type, detect automatically, or you can do a couple different things. It depends on how the file was saved. Detect automatically usually works pretty well. And by default, it says convert text to numbers, dates, and formulas, which is one of the strengths of Sheets. It actually does a wonderful job of this. I'm gonna click import data. It takes a moment, and now we've got our access times here. I'm gonna do something strange, well, actually, I'm gonna do something strange in just a moment. I am going to go through and I'm gonna get rid of my global statistics. I'm gonna show you why in just a moment. But I'm also going to go through and I'm going to import the other data. Upload, browse, and I'm gonna to go to the facility. Okay, uh, create new spreadsheet, replace, I don't wanna replace the current spreadsheet. Append to current sheet, that should basically put it at the bottom. I'm gonna click import data and there we go. We have imported this data. I'm gonna insert a row above so that I can actually tell where one of them ends and the other one end, uh, begins. I'm going to delete some of the information on this. Now, one of the things that you can do, 
we've got duration of that much time. You can double check on how you're working with this by doing something like uh, duration is your stop time minus your starting time. So watch what we can do. I can do equals to do some math and I can do stop time minus start time. And I get a very strange number here. Well, the reason why is uh, the, it defaults to that is the difference between these in days. If you're looking for minutes, the number you want is 1440. Take your value and multiply it by 1440. Here you go. Uh, while the report from STK actually rounds this to 1.904, or at least that's as far as the information, well, maybe actually it's just a formatting thing. Anyway, you can see here I get 1.904, etc. I can drag down and we end up with here is how we actually calculate these values. So you can do some of the things and double check STK, though STK is usually pretty good. Uh, 1,440 is the number of minutes in a day. So when you use these timestamps in uh, Google Sheets, it will actually then treat it as one day minus another. So the number it gives you is in days. You wanna convert it to minutes. You might use 24 if you wanted to convert it to hours, for instance. Okay, but the other thing that becomes nice about this is I can insert a column to the left. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to set up a situation where I could have, uh, let's see, um, what do I want? I'm gonna go with one for all of these. Now you can type that in or you can type one of them and drag the little circle down and it will just fill that in. And I'm gonna put zeros in for all of the other contacts for the facility. And it'll make sense why I'm doing this in just a moment, or at least what my plan is. Okay, now I've got all this information here where I've got at the top, the first admittedly smaller list gives me the timestamps of when I start and end contact with Miami. And on the bottom, I have all the times that I start and end contact with uh, the weather center. If I want them in chronological order, here's what I can do. I can select all of my data here go all the way down and include all of it. And now I'm going to sort and filter, create a filter. And I'm going to filter by my start time. I think A to Z, let's find out. Great, at least I think great, let me see. Um, I'm more used to working with this in Excel, although Excel is kind of uh, picky about importing date time or times and dates. Uh, sheets makes it go a little bit faster. But if I've done this correctly, um, I should have it where I've now organized this by the start time. So all of these are in order. And why did I put all the zeros and ones there? All the zeros are times that I contact the uh, facility and all the ones are times that I'm actually scanning. So these first ones here, I might have contact time of, let's see, uh, I can go down to the first uh, one that comes in and I can do equals sum. And then I can sum all of these. And I can find I may have had 140 minutes worth of contact time with the facility, but I hadn't actually scanned any of the targets. And as a result, I got nothing to give them. So while my report would say that there's 140 minutes of me talking to the facility, I got nothing to give them. So that time won't help me. I've got two minutes, about 2.44. Here's where the ones and zeros help. I had ones next to something that is adding information. So I need, okay, I find out how much I get whenever I add information. Well, if there's a one, I could program this in that it says, if there's a one here, I add this number onto my running total. And then if there's a zero here, I can subtract off this. So if they were going at the same rate, hint, hint, they won't always, and you might have to have adjustments in there. But I could say that at this point, at 1357 to 1400, I get two and a half minutes worth of data. And then my next contact with the ground station at 1556, I could offload maybe 30 minutes of data. Well, at which point I could set this up where I know I've secured that two and a half minutes. I go through and I keep this running total and I have it add up the useful numbers at the bottom. Here's a way that you can control the chronology of this. Because a lot of times when you're looking at those reports, all it will tell you is the total number. 
But for a bunch of real life scenarios, it doesn't matter if you're talking to the home base unless you have something useful to give them. So here's what you could do. After you've set up the programming for a number of these, you might also be able to just go down here and duplicate. I made a copy of it, and now I can call this Orbit 2. Maybe give it a different name, something a little more descriptive, but it's up to you and how you keep track of it. Here's a way that you can go through and actually keep track of these. And you can also go through with this when you export a lighting time, which you can because it's just another report. So when we come in here and we go to say Boomersat and I go to uh, Reports and Graph Manager, let's see, I think I closed it since the last time we did this. So um, we do not necessarily have lighting times that would show up there. I'm gonna full screen this so I can find it. Let's see, uh, installed styles, I'm gonna make that bigger. Not graphs, I'm going to go to lighting times, wherever that is, lighting times, no. I really need to replace this mouse. Lighting times, report, yep, generate. So I got this here in minutes, and I've got all of my actual contacts there. Once again, export this as a CSV for your lighting times. Here's how you can check, oh, I'm in sunlight for 102 minutes, and then I go into darkness for a while. Hey, remember how I said that uh, you could go through and do the stop time minus the start time to find the duration? Well, STK is already giving you that, and you can do this in STK, but what if you were to take the start time of the second one minus the stop time of the first one? Well, that would give you the duration of how long you're in the dark, which might be useful to make certain you don't run out of juice during that time. That's the other reason I'm showing you this. I don't think it'll show up in QR1, but I wanted to show you the CSVs and how to organize things. Because again, even with this sample scenario and other ones we have seen semi-recently, it is very common that you're getting information from one spot and getting it back to somewhere else. Well, it's only useful to contact the home base if you've got information to give them. So here's a way that you can keep track of that. Okay. I apologize about the very long video, but hopefully this is giving you a lot of good information that will be used throughout our seasons.